Hi everyone and welcome to another Eco-Social with World Centric. As you know, we're celebrating Earth Day this week by talking to thought leaders from a variety of organizations around how the work that they're doing is having a beneficial impact on the environment. Each year, World Centric donates a minimum 25% of our profits to grassroots organizations around the world that are working to create a better world. We mainly work with communities experiencing extreme poverty, which is defined as living on less than $1.90 per day. So imagine trying to live here in the US on less than 60 bucks a month. Spark Micro Grants is working with communities in East Africa, namely Uganda, Burundi, and Rwanda, to provide economic opportunities. We've been working with Spark Micro Grants since 2016, and we really appreciate their approach to community-driven development, which we're gonna learn more about today. So I'm gonna be joined by Shai Fogelson, Shai, if you're on here, you can go ahead and hit that little request button. And Shai has been working with Spark Micro Grants since 2017. And we've been working with him pretty much that entire time. He does the reporting for us and provides us with updates on the projects that we are funding. And uh, he oversees all grants and US-based events. Let's get him in here. Um, I'm going to sing his praises for a second because this is something I did not know about Shai, that he has his Master's of Research in Primate Biology, Behavior and Conservation, and his Master's in Science, Technology, and Environmental Policy, Environmental Sustainability, and Wildlife Conservation. Shai, I had no idea. We've talked so many times, and this is the first that I've heard about that part of your background. It must give you a very unique lens to view your work in East Africa. Yes, uh, thank you very much for having me on. And can you hear me, Janae? Yep. Okay, great. I just want to start by saying we are huge fans of World Centric and very thankful for showcasing us today and getting to chat with you. Um, yeah, I think coming from a background of wildlife conservation and then getting to uh, focus on community development. It's very interesting to think about the ways that you have this cross-section between the two fields because a lot of times when you're focusing on working with resource poor communities in regions of the world that actually are quite close to uh, areas that are in need of conservation, it's important to develop policies and programs that are going to take care of both the environmental needs but also the needs of those communities. Absolutely. Well, let's dive right into it. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how Spark was founded and how it's evolved to be what it is today. Absolutely. And just before that, Spark Microgrants has a team of about 50 folks, other than myself and Sasha, who are based in New York. The other staff are based in East Africa. For the most part, we're an East African based organization, and that's where all the amazing work happens. Um, Spark started in 2010. Our executive director and co founder, Sasha Fisher, after college, went to East Africa uh, to do some, some work and some volunteer work and noticed pretty quickly that a lot of the support that was being given to communities in those regions was very prescriptive. And unfortunately, this is how a lot of international aid is done. And so what I mean by that is organizations, NGOs, even though they have the best intentions, oftentimes go into these communities, say, oh, I think you need to build a school or, oh, I think you need a water well. We're going to give you money and you need to do this. And even though these intentions are good, oftentimes these projects are not successful because the community doesn't have say in the matter. They don't have a lot of buy-in. And so these projects end up uh, breaking down or going to waste. And she just continued to see uh, areas of the aid community that were not really functioning properly. And so out of this, over the last 10 years, Sasha founded Spark and developed this model called the Facilitative Collective Action Process, which really works to put uh, the power and the decision making in the hands of the communities. That's a perfect transition because I was about to ask you about the FCAP, which you said very quickly right there. Tell us a little bit more about what the FCAP is and that process. Absolutely. So as I just mentioned, the whole point of what we do is putting the power and decision making in the hands of the communities. So it's very important from start to finish that the community is deciding what their goals are going to be 
uh, envisioning what those solutions could be towards those goals, and then really making decisions um, all along the way with the type of projects they want to implement uh, and everything that goes into that. And so this facilitative collective action process, which we call the FCAP to make it much easier to say, mm -hmm. is a six month process where we bring together the community for weekly meetings where they deliberate on potential projects that they can choose. Uh, and then once they've chosen a project, built a project plan, done feasibility studies, all sorts of work on the technical side, Spark then supports them with an $8,000 seed fund that allows them to get this project off the ground. And what we've seen with this process is by investing the six months of community building at the beginning, that initial $8,000 seed fund doesn't just lead to one project, it usually leads to many more because the communities have this process that they continue to use over time. Can you give us some examples of projects communities have chosen? Absolutely. So the majority of our communities are based in East and West Africa, and for the most part, they're agrarian communities and subsistence farmers. So a lot of the projects that get chosen are around farming. So whether that's an agricultural business to do intensive farming, um, whether it's doing some smaller micro livestock uh, to provide some protein, um, or it could also be like a grinding mill type project. Other projects that we've seen have been more on the social enterprise side. So it might be doing some wholesale businesses um, or doing some bicycle taxiing businesses, um, but different types of ways to generate revenue, increase household income, and then that income is usually used to launch additional projects as well. It seems like with all of these projects, part of the idea is that, that they go on and create more income for the community and that they have indirect impacts. Can you talk a little bit more about some of those indirect impacts that can come from these projects? Absolutely. And, and you said it perfectly. I, I think the idea is once Spark has made that initial investment, we want to make sure that the community is self-sustaining and you continue to see the direct impacts and then the indirect impacts that flow from that initial project. So for instance, a community may choose an agricultural project and that will definitely help with providing additional nutrition and food resources, but they'll be able to take the revenue generated from that project and purchase goods for their houses. So they'll build roofs for their homes to make sure that they're more stable or they'll build roofs on their latrines in order to improve hygiene. Oftentimes the revenue generated from these projects are used to pay for healthcare or pay for school fees for their children. So that initial project ends up having many different benefits that support the community on different levels. And since we're here to celebrate Earth Day, what are some of the environmental benefits that come from these projects? Absolutely. So as I said, a lot of the projects that are done are agricultural in nature. And I know oftentimes when we think agriculture, we think sort of these massive sprawling plantations that can uh, oftentimes be negative for the environment. For the most part, the communities that we work with have engaged in the past in some slash and burn agriculture. Uh, and for those mm -hmm. of you that don't know, if you are growing crops in one field, you end up then burning the field next and then the one next in order to sort of regenerate the land uh, for additional crop growth. This is not very environmentally friendly. And so one of the things that we try to do with these communities is when they do engage in agricultural projects is provide them with the technical skills, the seeds and the resources to engage in more intensive and sustainable farming. So that means using one plot of land and continuing to reuse that land using different types of crops that can work in harmony with one another and making sure that they're properly seeding during the right seasons. And so by doing this, you're taking better care of the land and you're making sure that you're not uh, destroying other environmental factors around you. So you're not encroaching on forest or potentially degrading uh, the surrounding areas. So I'd say that that's one thing that we do with the um, sort of intensive uh, agriculture. And then another big one is we're seeing some communities start solar panel projects. And so very few of these communities have stable electricity. And the ones that are able to get electricity are often using diesel power generators or gasoline power generators and those are definitely not very environmentally friendly and so what some communities have done now with the resources and the revenue generated from that first project is purchasing solar panels and then using that renewable energy power uh, to power cell phones and other important tools hmm. i've noticed in a lot of the projects that we have funded or the communities that we have funded the projects they've chosen have been cattle projects and an indirect benefit environmentally has been that they're using the manure from the cows to fertilize the land and have better production in crops, better water retention, 
you know, all these beneficial side effects from what would initially seem like a very simple cattle project. Absolutely. So I think livestock in general, especially in that re region, are huge uh, assets for these communities. They're stable assets. You can hold on to them. And so even in times like we're in right now with a pandemic, um, they're assets that aren't going to necessarily go away. So uh, cows and cattle in particular are great for these communities to have. And in particular, the cattle are being used for the manure that they provide. So uh, from an environmental standpoint, cattle manure is much better for the land than any kind of uh, pesticides or other forms of fertilizer that have chemicals in it that can run off into water sources mm -hmm. and have negative effects. And so for that reason, the manure allows for sort of cleaner agriculture. And as you mentioned before, um, they're able to produce more crops because it's natural manure and uh, they're able to get in quite large quantities just because of the amount of uh, manure that the cows are producing. And so it's a really nice feedback system in which they get the, the benefit from the cows with the protein from the milk source, but also mm. the benefits from the manure that's coming from the cows as well. Yeah. You touched on the pandemic. How is that affecting Spark communities and how is Spark as an organization working to respond? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're obviously taking it, it very seriously. Uh, one of the things that, that's most important to do during this time is to not gather it as a community because um, you want to spread or you want to prevent the spread of, of the coronavirus. So in early March, we made the decision as an organization that we were going to put a pause on community meetings because we wanted to make sure that we weren't going to necessarily be in a position to, to spread this virus. But it's incredibly important for us to continue to engage and continue to work with these communities. So each community that we work with has an elective community-based official. And so this is a young adult that lives in that community that has a smartphone that helps us with this FCAP process. So even though we're currently not in those communities as a prevention measure, we're still able to text and interact with this community-based facilitator in each of these communities, send them messages uh, related to health concerns, uh, any kind of messaging that the local government is sharing, and then also check in with them on the projects. So just making sure that the funds are being used properly, um, making sure that if it is a cattle project that they're checking up on the cattle. So as best as possible uh, in an imperfect world, making sure that we are connecting with these communities and still having a remote sort of uh, sort of impact or influence with them. And, and that being said, I think it's, it's very important to uh, understand that these are very remote and resource poor communities. So right now in the countries in which we work, which are Rwanda, Uganda, and Burundi, uh, the virus for the most part has stayed within the capital cities or the more urban areas. And the governments have done a great job with containing that virus. Um, but we want to make sure that these rural communities that we work with are going to be prepared uh, with the knowledge and sort of know-how to how to sort of take care of this matter and prevent the spread of it. Hmm. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I had mentioned at the beginning of this that these are all communities experiencing extreme poverty, living on less than a dollar and ninety a day. What does life look like for these communities? And also, how can people support these communities? Because even though coronavirus has not reached them, we're estimating that there's going to be a very large economic impact to East African countries. And so these places are already food insecure, um, living on very small amounts of money or no money, subsistence farmers. This is going to have a really big impact. Um, what are kind of your thoughts around these communities moving, moving forward and what can people do? Absolutely. And thank you for that. I think one of the sad things is when you have pandemics or any kind of uh, disaster like this, it's the very vulnerable communities of the hardest hit. And so you have uh, these populations that are already lacking in food security, um, have little to no access to clean water, um, no steady electricity, and just no real access to health care that are now going to be facing uh, a potential huge threat if it does reach the rural area. And even if it doesn't, as you said, uh, the economic backlash that's going to happen from uh, the coronavirus hitting the continent is is massive. And so I think continuing to support these communities, uh, both with funding, so uh, being able to donate what you can, and you can visit our website at sparkmicrograms.org, and then also continuing to sort of read about our communities, following us, following us um, on our social media and on our website, 
we consistently have good material posting about like sort of what our communities are up to, what's happening in the region, uh, and just trying to keep you up to date on sort of what's new in those areas and sort of the, the stories that are coming out of those areas. But I think the main thing is just um, really continuing to, to understand that there is a, a group of people out there that are very much in need. I think there's a tendency when something like this happens in our own backyards, we focus very much inwardly and think about, okay, what's happening in Brooklyn where I'm living or, or in California and, and really mm -hmm. staying focused on that. And I think it's important to take care of yourselves, but also really consider these vulnerable populations around the world uh, that are just as much, if not even more so in need right now. Absolutely. And I really encourage people to learn more about community driven development as well. That's one of the things that we truly appreciate about Spark Microgrants is putting the decision making power into the hands of local people. Um, I'm sure you have resources on your website for that. Yes, uh, I can talk until I'm blue in the face about community driven development, but it's a uh, a pretty important process and it, it really does help make a difference when it comes to international aid and making sure that communities around the world are in the driver's seat of their own development and are really able to make sustainable and lasting change. So uh, please visit our website and feel free to email me at shy at sparkmicrograms.org for more information and thank you very much, Janae. Thank you, Shai. And uh, again, like he mentioned, you can go on their website to donate and help support these communities. Thank you so much for your time. Any final words for our audience? Uh, just keep uh, using world-centric products and we are <laughs> incredibly thankful uh, to be a part of your family and continue to go to your uh, gatherings and events that you have around the country. And um, it's really important to have different uh, partners and stakeholders involved in this fight to address uh, sort of increased poverty around the world and, and community driven development. So we couldn't do it without the support of yours and those that are listening today. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks again for your time. Hopefully I'll get to see you in person sometime in the near future. Yes, absolutely. Have a good All one. All right. Today. Have a great rest of your day. Take care. Yeah. So like Shai mentioned, it takes all of us to create change in the world. We have many great nonprofit partners here at World Centric. And if you visit our website, worldcentric.com, under the impact page, you can see all our different partners working around the world. And I'll actually be talking to two more of our partners tonight at 8 p.m. Pacific time. I'll be talking with Barika Poole from Spouts of Water. You might wonder why the 8 p.m. time, and that's because she will be talking to us from Uganda, where she's based. And then tomorrow, Friday, we'll be talking with Daniela from Trees Water People, who's doing work in Central America. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you back here later.